Welcome back to this month's OIS Retina Podcast, where Dr. Ray Hall is joined by the legendary Dr. Steve Charles, who sheds light on retinal surgery techniques, technology, and teaching. Let's listen in. Welcome back, everyone, to the OIS Retina Podcast. Again, this is Faras Rahal. Uh, I'm the host. I'm a member of the Retina Vitreous Associates Medical Group here in Los Angeles. I'm, I'm also a partner and a founding member of Excite Ventures, which is centered in New York and also here in Los Angeles. Uh, today, I'm super delighted to have an amazing guest. He happens to be my friend, but he also happens to be a legend in our business of retina surgery and in a lot of aspects of retina surgery, retina development, retina innovation. Everyone who has been around this business even for a minute in the last 40 years knows who Steve Charles is. My guest is Dr. Steve Charles. I, I can't give his fair bio because we'd spend the next 90 minutes doing it, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a quick list of a few things just to give a background on some of the amazing accomplishments. And then I want to talk to him for the next 30 to 60 minutes about some of these great accomplishments and the future. Uh, Steve has performed himself over 40,000 vitreoretinal surgeries in his career. He's lectured in over 50 countries. He's operated in 25, which is amazing. Uh, Steve has authored a textbook that we all know about, uh, and it's now in his fifth or maybe sixth edition, Steve? Sixth edition is at the printer and released September 8th. Five languages. He's published over 150 original articles and, and 47 book chapters at last count, although I'm sure that's still growing as well. Uh, he has a background education that includes mechanical and electrical engineering. Of course, he has a medical degree, residency in ophthalmology, fellowship at the NIH in vitreo retinal surgery and other things. And I, I assumed you had a lot of patents, Steve. I didn't know quite how many. 106 issued or pending patents at last count. What a run. We can't cover it all in one second, but... Maybe just start with a little bit of the medical training background. Uh, you did some NIH, I know, and, and maybe you can tell us about some of that in your, your residency experience. Sure. I went to med school in Miami. My dad was a professor at the University of Miami undergraduate. He was an art professor. And so he knew Dr. Norton, the founder of Ascom Palmer. And, uh, but I decided when I was in engineering school that I wanted to, one, continue engineering throughout my career, and two, I wanted to be a microsurgeon. So that my first, I didn't have any money. I stayed at the VA in Coral Gables, uh, part of the University of Miami Med School, and uh, and I it's a blood drawer at four o'clock in the morning to have free room and board. So I hung out with the eye residents. I watched a little ENT. I watched a little neurosurgery. It was a slam dunk. I want to be an ophthalmologist. We're talking about two weeks into med school. Firm decision, ophthalmology. Already started hanging with the retina people. Started working at the Baskin Palmer in the lab. Built an ERG machine from scratch. Built an EOG machine from scratch. Built an ultrasound machine from scratch built an infrared pupillography machine from scratch. Uh, and so I operated on monkeys and, and cats uh, in the middle of the night as a med student when I was on call. I'd you know, be in the emergency room and then run over there and do monkey surgery at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning by myself. And I did that all through four years of med school internship and during my three years of residency. And then Dr. Norton made an arrangement with NEI. They had like 400 applicants and they took two people. And, uh, and I was fortunate to be one of them. And I built the vitrectomy program there. So there was an agreement that I would be trained in vitrectomy by Mockamer as a resident so I could bring the vitrectomy program to NIH. So I did the first cases, ordered the equipment, trained the team, and then I started development work. So I've invented endophotocoagulation and fluid air exchange and endodrainage to up fluid, uh, built the first real-time grayscale B scan, hand built the first endophotocoagulator myself. Uh, and while I was at NIH, Finally finished there, went into practice. Memphis is a low-tech city except in spine and orthopedics. Uh, so that's big metal cutting stuff. There's no electronics or photonics. So I traveled a lot and I began flying jets and I commuted a lot to Orange County. And I built a company out there that Alcon bought that resulted in the Accurs and the Constellation. But before that, I helped Carl Wong build uh, uh, Midlabs, which was the MDS machine. And before that, I developed the Occutome 8000, which was the first linear suction machine with CooperVision. So the engineering has continued. It gets harder every year because it's more complex. The easy stuff has been done. Uh, the Constellation had 14 processors and 750,000 lines of code. And the next generation machine I'm working on, the Alcon will have 
more lines of code and 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 more processors and and more functionality. So uh, uh, the, it ups the game where right? you have to study instead of microprocessors, FPGAs and GPUs and uh, and bus architectures and real time operating systems and such things and motor control schemes. So I'm continuing to teach myself engineering. So every single holiday night weekend, I'm studying engineering or stem cell biology because I'm doing a big project at the NIH with outer rent replacement. It's a lot that you're doing now, we know, and I'm absolutely coming back to the here and now uh, after I hear a little more about the background. You mentioned Alcon, your association, uh, decades long association with Alcon and your instrumental, in fact, creation of Accuracy and Constellation are well known to anybody who does this surgery like myself. And by the way, the Constellation is phenomenal. When you started way back after finishing your training, and it sounds like you were already doing a lot of engineering and innovation during your training, um, was it your goal? What was your first goal? Be a great clinician? Was the innovation part of it uh, just a, a part of that equation? Was it your goal to innovate new things or or did that just come about in the course of solving problems? It's really a problem solving thing. When you look at engineers, uh, it, it's, I mean, patents are just a business strategy. Uh, it isn't about how many you got on your wall. It's not something you stuff your resume or CV with. It's, it's, it's a business protection. So my goal wasn't to have X number of patents. My goal wasn't to be famous. My goal was to solve problems that we experience every day in the operating room. And people have said to me things that, that I find ridiculous, quite honestly. They'll say, well, if you like engineering so much, why don't you quit surgery? That's like saying, let's have an aeronautical engineer that's never been in a plane. Oh, great. Yeah, thank you. You know, yeah. uh, the best aeronautical engineers are also pilots that fly heavy duty aircraft, you know, uh, and, and I happen to fly a jet. So I, so I know a bit about that as well. But, but um, high volume surgery plus developing the equipment or go hand in hand. Uh, many of the techniques I developed were on the fly in the operating room. I, I, I was at the NIH. I did a penetrating keratoplasty, um, took the button off. I, I knew there was a cataract. I could see that. I thought there was a vitreous hemorrhage. Took the button off, took the lens out, and there was a detachment behind the vitreous hemorrhage. And I said, you know, I think I'll put the vitreous cutter in the retinal break and drain all the fluid out. And I said, whoa, the retina went flat. I sewed the button on, took an hour and a half. And I said, why, we should always drain through the retinal break. Why do we do a cut down to the sclera the way Mockamer did? And so that's how endo drainage came about. I, I wanted to fill the eye with air. And I said, you know what? I think I'll connect air to the infusion system of the vitreous cutter. Why are we injecting with a separate needle the way Mockamer did and flattening the eye out and reinflating it with gas? Let's do fluid air. So a lot of things happen on the fly. Or I'll be in the operating room and I'll have an idea and then I'll make notes. I'd be my laptop right outside the door of the OR, and I'm constantly working on PowerPoints for the engineering team and working on uh, what they call memorandums of invention and patent revisions in between cases. Well, and the teaching is a natural outgrowth of that. My dad was a college professor, and he was a terrific speaker, and I used to be his projectionist, so I'd go to all his lectures and run the slides for him, and I learned a certain speaking style that it seems to work for me. Uh, so I don't speak about stuff I looked up in, in textbooks and copy articles out and put statistics up. I speak about stuff that I personally am involved in all day, every day, that I, much of which I've actually developed. It makes for talks that are much better, honestly. I think when you have somebody on a podium uh, speaking really off the cuff based on personal experience that, that doesn't need rehearsing or even slides, it comes off much better because it's real knowledge, it's real time, rather than sort of just, you know, regurgitated. I agree totally. Yeah, I call the regurgitator slide readers. <laughs> sort of. It, it's totally true. I find the making of slides kind of the worst part of preparing to do a podium talk. I actually like the talk itself, but preparing the slide seems like even regurgitation for yourself sitting at home. <laughs> <laughs> when you when you started doing all these things, and I of course there's the Alcon Association, but you mentioned MVS and so many other developments. A lot of this has to be done hand in hand with industry. You have a great reputation with industry. You're in great demand for companies to get your assistance and help. How did that start? Did they seek you out? Was it happenstance? How how did the relationship with industry begin? Um, it, it, with regarding, you know, at the NIH, of course, it's, there's no industry involvement by definition. So the patents, the first patents I got at the NIH were on a syringe drive and a chin switch. 
and L and NEI owned those. And then the, the real-time grayscale ultrasound, there was a vendor in town that worked at the National Bureau of Standards that, that built an ultrasound per my design with me. And then I commissioned him to build a, a personal unit for me in Memphis, and then people started buying them. But with respect to industry, uh, there, a guy that I lost contact with almost immediately he said, can I show you the Connor O'Malley detractomy machine, the Occutome 800? And I was using the DuBois rotor extractor my first year in practice. He brought it by and I said, this is it. This is a home run hit. This is a great idea. This is far better than Mockamer's and DuBois's approach. You know, it's divided three-port vitrectomy instead of one-port vitrectomy. And so uh, I didn't approach them. They approached me. And, and so we bought one. And, and I adapted fluid air exchange into photocoagulation, segmentation, retinectomy, subretinal surgery. All these techniques I developed, I, I adapted them to that. And, and I went to the academy in Las Vegas. And, and their sales rep was a, really a fireball. And he, and he said, Steve, Charles, the foremost advocate of this machine. I, I didn't get paid. I didn't. I wasn't an investor. I didn't own anything. So all these people lined up outside some hotel room while I gave speeches on the hockey jump. So that was my first sort of KOL experience. And uh, and then, then I started working with Berkeley, and then pretty soon Cooper Vision bought them. And I started working with them. And again, in those days, I didn't even get paid. I paid my own transportation. And uh, But that's how linear suction or proportional vacuum got embedded. That was my, my, the first patent that ended up on a machine. And that was the Occutum 8000. And Conor O'Malley was a real sweetheart. We lost him, unfortunately, several years ago. And Conor was, came and stood by me and gave me a hug in front of the machine. So instead of being threatened by it, he, was, he saw the future that way and, and was just very gracious about it. So but then I've, uh, Cooper Vision didn't want to do disposable cutters. So Carl Wong and I started MidLabs. It was incorporated in Tennessee. I raised the money. I wrote the business plan. Um, I didn't make any money on it. But I, but I, um, that's where the first disposable cutter with the hour lash shape came about, and much faster fluidics, and uh, so, so that was mid labs. And then I flew around the country trying to get companies to buy mid labs, first stores, uh, which became B and L, and then others, and then I got Alcon to buy them finally. And then I didn't make any money in that transaction either. But, but um, I was supposed to get a finder's fee, and it didn't work out right. And I said, hey, I'll start my own company. So I started InnoVision. I raised all the money for that. And we had 100 employees and built a machine that we actually used in the operating room. And so that's how, and that's what led to the Ackers and the Constellation. So then in 1991, when Alcon bought the InnoVision technology, um, then I got a formal consulting agreement. And but because they bought Ackers, I didn't get a royalty on that. But then I, I had a bunch of intellectual property that resulted in the Constellation. So I did have a 10 year royalty run in the Constellation. I, I like that you use the term KOL, which is now a commonplace term in our specialty and others. And I always had some issue with it, but I, I've come to know what it means today. And I have an understanding of what it meant to me then. I was a resident in 1991, some of the time periods you're talking about. And I had the fortune of training under Stanley Chang and learning about some of those machines. And I had a different impression of KOLs then. Do you get the sense that sometimes today the KOL industry relationship can be uh, tail wagging the dog? Sometimes it seems like people make themselves into a KOL, whereas in a situation like your own, uh, you were doing the, the deeds and doing the work. And so you were sought after in order to be a consultant because you'd already done the work. It seems sometimes in reverse now. Is that, am I exaggerating I could, that? I, could, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, there was a guy who actually served 42 months in the penitentiary, I won't mention his name, that was here in Memphis for Medicare fraud with, with faking Lucentis injections. And, 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 and he was sought after at one time to, to be an advocate for PDT and then and later for Lucentis. And, and, I, and I called the company and I said, look, I, KOL, A, you're supposed to have K, knowledge. Yes. And o, your opinion is supposed to matter. And L, you're supposed to be a leader. He's none of the above. He's a high volume user with a big ego. Uh, and it turns out he was not only doing it properly, so the Medicare would lock him up. But it, that, that doesn't count. It's not about being a high volume user of the product. My, my situation is unique. As you well know, when you go to meetings, it's commonplace for people that are 
really bright and effective people like David Boyer, your partner, and David Brown that are the leaders in medical retina to consult for 25 or 30 companies. And that's perfectly mm -hmm. fine. It makes perfect sense in the pharmaceutical space. But with the equipment side, I, I wanted to be an insider. I want to be a real engineer on Alcon's team where I'm talking about manufacturing processes and, and literally helping influence choices of bus architectures and processors and motor control theory. You can't do that in the normal KOL where it's a very formalized meeting. Hey, doctor, what do you think about this? And there's five of your colleagues there and they all opine on how it works. I don't want to be one of those guys. I call that a wine tasting. And, and so <laughs> that's why I only consult for Alcon. So since January of 91, I've consulted for one company. I did consult for Grishaber until, and then of course Alcon bought them. So that's, that's it in all those years. And so yeah, we do clinical trials, but I'm not a consultant for anybody else, never. And, and that way you're, you're an insider and you can really help them with, with building product. I, I agree 100% and I'll, I'll add some color to that from my side and I won't waste any more time from myself on it. But as an investor, and I'm involved in a lot of these meetings, uh, with startups deciding whether to make an investment with the VC firm or not. And so um, you, you hear from their KOLs or they're giving you the names of their KOLs, most of the guys that I actually know and am friendly with. And what I have found is when you put all the KOLs, so to, so to speak, together on a panel, and they're all at the same time, it becomes a bit of an echo chamber. No one ever disagrees with each other. So the consultation from the investor side, which in that, when I'm wearing that hat, it becomes almost uh, not useful because they're all saying oh, the same like thing. Yeah, and they're agreeing with each other where you really want to hear who's got a negative opinion on this product to help me decipher if sure. this is worthwhile carrying to the finish line or not. Yeah, and I, and I, you know, one of the things that I realize is that with, with companies is that if you're going to get product out there, if you can possibly work with the market share leader, that's how the product gets in the most doctor's hands and helps the most patients. So Alcon's the market share leader and has been throughout the duration of, of the 30 years of working with them. And, and now that means because they're big, that the, the decision making is very complex. So there are numerous people on the commercial side and marketing and, and sales that have input, even people on the service side, oh, that's hard to fix. It's hard to repair. The warranty costs will be too high. So it isn't about talking to your sales rep who introduces you to one marketing guy. That's how most docs get involved with companies. How, with me, it's talking to, to the line engineer. There's 150 engineers on the next generation Baco machine, 150 engineers. I know two thirds of them on a first name basis and, and talk to them on a regular basis. So it, does, it doesn't get funneled through you know, one door. Uh, but that's because I don't consult for anybody else. And they know that if, if they share an idea with me, it's not going outside the company. Yeah, they're definitely the 800 pound gorilla and for good reason. They've made unbelievably great products for a long time. We're all using them every day and addicted to them. I'm gonna ask you a question that may be hard to answer, maybe not. Uh, like asking to choose uh, which is the best of your children. And in your case, there's 20,000 examples, but of all, and because then I want to move on to what you're currently doing, but sure. of these, of this myriad of previous accomplishments and developments and innovations and, and the surgery itself and the patients, uh, what do you think about most often when you're taking a moment to feel gratified about what you've done? Is there a certain aspect of this run that gives you the greatest feeling of joy or, or what? Well, it's interesting. It's in two categories. If, and I never thought about that specific question until this moment, but, but the, the, the techniques are different than the technology in this sense. Techniques can work on many people's machines. So endo drainage of subadenal fluid is not machine dependent. Endophotocoagulation isn't. Scissor segmentation, scissor segmentation, delamination, ports of memory filling, retinectomy, uh, subretinal surgery. Those are techniques that every vitreoretinal surgeon in the world uses, and those impact a lot of patients, and they're independent of the machine. So, for, so as a surgeon uh, and a teacher, I'm glad that those things work out, that everybody uses them. Nobody says, oh, that's a bad technique. We don't use that. Everybody uses that list. Um, now, with respect to technology, each generation has been far more complex, more lines of code, more, more components, more processes. And so obviously the constellation at the moment is the penultimate, but that said, the next generation FACO machine is, I happen to, I can't talk about it because it's 
pre-launch, but it is an extraordinary machine. I've done pig eye surgery with it, not living pigs. And I'll do that again this coming Friday, as a matter of fact. And uh, it's, so that will be the machine I'm the most proud of. Uh, but it's you know, sitting on the top of the Constellation and the Akers and the MBS and before that, the Akitome 8000. So it's my fifth generation machine. Yeah, I agree with the theme. It's got to be super gratifying uh, to hear people use the term air fluid exchange or fluid air exchange like I do 10 times a week, as you imagine as a retina surgeon, and, and um, know that that was coined because of something you did first and, and shared with the rest of us. That's amazing, man, really. Right, so it's t- I, Sometimes when people ask me, what do you do? I say the three T's, technique, technology, and teaching, and they all have massive overlap. None of them are freestanding. They don't compete with each other for time. They're all part of the same story. Good. I want to talk about teaching with you in a moment, but first give me a little, we're going to get to the present. Tell me about your current uh, practice. It sounds from previous conversations we've had, you're still full steam ahead in the clinic and in the OR. What's your practice like? You have partners or are you a sure. solo flyer? Well, we have, we have, I have uh, an MD partner, uh, two MD partners. Uh, one was surgical and now does medical only and is a world-class ROP expert. We manage over uh, 190 beds, NICU beds. We have the biggest ROP practice in the country or in the world. And Dr. Paul Rungi does that. And he trained with me 30 years ago and then practiced in Sarasota and then came back a little over two years ago. And it's been a real blessing for the fellows and for the ROP babies. It's extraordinary. And then, of course, he sees medical retina patients in the office, although he's surgery trained. And then Stephen Huddleston is an associate. He trained with me. He's been with me uh, through residency and then fellowship and then been an associate and, and owns half the practice with me. We have two full-time optometrists whose job is liaison with the optometric community. And the senior one is the most respected uh, optometrist in the country in terms of retinal imaging. So he gives all, he knows the Heidelberg and the Optos and all this stuff inside and out. And has been involved in a lot of clinical trials on equipment. And so we have a good team that way. I see 70 to 75 patients every Monday and every Wednesday, the two patient days. And then once a month, I see about 55 at our satellite in Mississippi in Oxford. And I've, I did 682 vitrectomies in 2020, the COVID year. And I'll probably do 750 this year. So that's 16, 17, 18 a week, 15 a week. But I work 52 weeks a year. I haven't been on vacation in 25 years. <laughs> I don't have a house. I don't have a wife, a bird, a plant, or a fish. Uh, I got the jobs. That is incredible, man. 700 plus vitrectomies a year. That That's super high volume. And I know it's right because you've been doing it a long time. 46 years. 46 years now since you finished. July 1st, is, it was, uh, I was a little bit in practice. 46 years since of July 1st. Obviously, no sign of slowing down. No slowing down and no interest in retirement. I no. don't know. People say, don't you want to smell the roses? I said, no, they make you sneeze. I'm not sure. <laughs> the, the roses are the OR for you and maybe some surgical devices. Nothing wrong with that. And around here, people always say, is it your calling? And I say, no, I, I must be on call forwarding. Nobody's called me. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> with all the surgery and all the development, so what's, what's next for us, like the, the next generation that will come post-Constellation? Of course, there's always one in the works. I'm sure you're in, involved in some of these projects, if not all of them. Uh, where, where do we still need to improve a lot with technique and or technology in the OR? What's next? I, the, the, the next generation FACO bit will have a, a, a new approach to fluidics, which I'm, which I'm I, uh, I'm very proud of. I did not invent it, but I endorse it, and I, I played a role in it. Uh, they, um, it has some other features that I think will be great. Uh, but actually, I think the biggest impact is on visualization. I bought out of, out of my pocket, not the surgery center, not the hospital, the first ingenuity in the country. I'm, I don't get a royalty. I didn't invent it. But now I've invented a bunch of stuff that goes on Ingenuity 2.0, and that will make visualization far better. It will help us deal with multifocal IOLs. It'll help us deal with glare. It'll improve color quality as well as resolution. And uh, so I'm actively involved on the photonic side uh, on making Ingenuity 2.0 a lot better uh, than Ingenuity. But I do every case with Ingenuity, uh, except for a few that I have to do at the Baptist Hospital, like I had to do this morning. But um, so I, visualization is the next big thing. Um, the other thing I'm involved in is um, 
a big project at the NIH. Uh, I built a vitrectomy program there back in 73, 75. Uh, they never had vitrectomy there before. And, uh, and about five years ago, Juan Amaral, who uh, was the top vitreoretinal surgeon in Peru, uh, well, he contacted me. He joined the NEI probably 15 years ago. He wanted to do bench research, and he does a ton of animal surgery. We've done over 500 pigs, so we're using uh, C we're using venipuncture to extract CD34 positive hematopoietic stem cells from the circulation. Those are then transformed first to neural crest cells, you know, in tissue culture to authentic RPE cells on a biodegradable scaffold. I'm not a believer in perylene or or any permanent material uh, scaffold. I think it's going to cause inflammation. I believe in a biodegradable scaffold that's ultra thin, low volume. Uh, so there's a high density of the RPE cells that are heavily oriented in a monolayer and they're inserted under the macula through a tiny retinotomy, two by four millimeter patch. And I'm doing my first patient Thursday of next week after doing many, many pig surgeries up there. The team has done 500 and I've done probably 30. And, and, and I help them improve the technique and develop some of the, of the instruments that, have, that are special for this insertion of this very flimsy monolayer of cells under the macula. So this is a, I'm glad you brought it up because I wanted to ask you about modern regenerative medicine and your interest and or role and thoughts about it. In this specific project, you're talking about an RPE sheet. Is this for ge geographic atrophy potentially? Yes, sir. that's the first round and, we, and we're approved to do, I'm approved to do up to 12 patients by the FDA one at a time. Uh, but we've, in the lab, we've also done a, 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 with one a scaffold of photoreceptors on the top and RPE underneath properly oriented. And those have been implanted in the in the pig model of, of GA and they work. So we can do what we call outer retinal replacement, both RPE with autologous cells. So there's no rejection, not embryonic stem cells that require um, uh, immune suppression. So no immune suppression um, and, and with autologous cells. And that's extremely exciting. Literally they do 25 different tests to guarantee these cells are, are safe and effective. So they're not, for example, peripheral RPE doesn't support the macula. Bill Tasman published on that 30 years ago. And uh, it has to be the RPE that belongs under the macula. Ectopic maculas lose vision uh, in their 20s and 30s. So it's not just any RPE, it's not only authentic, it's not only safe, but think about it, it's new, it's nascent. So when you have a disease that, although it's genetic, with dry MD, geographic atrophy, it takes time. And so now you've installed, you know, baby RPE, which is exciting. And uh, so I'm really fired up about that and with re replacing the photoceptors as well. And we work with David Gamm at the University of Wisconsin and a company up there called Opsis. Fujifilm put 400 million into Cellular Dynamics International that owns Opsis. So that's uh, where there's technology sharing back and forth between NEI, and this bunch at the University of Wisconsin and Madison and a spinoff huge company there. Uh, uh, Jamie Thompson is the co-inventor of induced pro-potential stem cells is there at the University of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. So very exciting projects. I'm, I'm not involved in gene therapy at all, uh, but, I, but, but I, you know, I study it and I kind of know what's going on. But I think the, the, the whole cell-based products, not cell suspensions, they do not work. You can't inject cells under the retina, you make PBR. Uh, if you inject stem cells in the eye, you make a teratoma or, 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 or a scar. So you have to make sure the cells are proper in a proper orientation in a cellular construct outside the body and then implant it. I think that makes a lot of sense. I'm familiar with that program and I've been directly involved here in LA uh, with Mark Mayan's RPT program, which is a perylene uh, patch. You've read the papers. We, we did 15 patients in the first cohort. And that's just an RPE layer. It's a brilliant concept. And I do think that this sandwiching and being able to, uh, uh, to do both layers simultaneously will be the best, maybe next frontier is uh, the idea is that if the GA is already there, the geographic atrophy, and you put the RPE cells, well, maybe that's too late. The I codes are the cones are maybe already gone. So maybe it's gonna have to be the sandwich approach as I call it, but both layers. And that's, and that's what, what we're doing. We've got quite a few pigs that way, but the protocol calls for us to an RPE first. Has to be autologous, can't be crowd preserved uh, according to the FDA. So that's what we're doing. I agree with you also about the injection part. I, it still escapes me a little, even though I'm involved in some of the trials of some of the injection protocols. 
um, injecting cells freely in a liquid form and expecting them to reorient and create a layer. It seems, it see, I, look, I'm not, a, I'm not a biological scientist in this regard, but it seems, it seems a long shot. Yep. They don't engraft properly. Uh, Kapil Bahardi runs the NEIs program. He's absolutely brilliant. And we discuss the various options that are out there all the time. I email four or five times a week. And, and uh, he certainly would agree with you. And that's who taught me this. He and David Gamm at, at uh, University of Wisconsin. So I've learned so much from them. You're, you're a surgeon. I mean, you're a gifted surgeon. So do you do feel then down in your heart of hearts that we could turn uh, GA and other kind of medical retina conditions into surgical diseases? You think these can be surgically corrected? I do. Uh, I, I think, you know, once cells are gone, uh, there's no pharmaceutical agent is going to make them come back. And, uh, and injecting uh, suspension of cells makes doesn't make it doesn't graft and it can make PBR. So I think this, yeah, you know, it's it's invasive surgery. The, the, the real issue is the larger the area that you replace, the larger the wound, and that's the challenge. Now, Mark Ryan, of course, believes you can fold the, the perilene. I'm concerned about cell adherence uh, once you fold. So so we're we're not folding. We're we're we have a two by four millimeter patch with a very special cannula that we patented. That, that is protects the cells in the cannula. So your, your insertion device for the subretinal space is a proprietary specific device for this procedure? Yes, and it, it, it has very low surface activity so the cells don't become irritated. It's kind of like Teflon and, it, mm -hmm. and there's patent applied for and it's curved. Uh, the, the, the material science of it was my idea. The, the curve was their idea because you want to inject tangential to the retina. You can't take a monolayer of cells and come at a retinotomy this way, or it just scrolls it up like a window shade. So you have to come at it at an angle almost uh, tangential to the retinal surface to get it to insert properly. And the tip of it, the design of it is very properly done in order to not scrape the pigment epithelium or the photoreceptors and to make sure there's no leak as you ease this thing into the subretinal space with, with Helon Pro. You've identified exactly something I've spoken about uh, with uh, some of the guys who've developed this concept, uh, that that curvature is key and you're, you're trying to bang it against, uh, <laughs> uh, you're going through the retinotomy in the, wrong, uh, in the wrong direction. And you do need a very specific device with that curvature or bend to slide it in properly without damaging the already present RPE or choroid or the device or the implant itself. You're absolutely right. Absolutely. And so are you, just for technique, since a lot of our viewers are vitreoretinal surgeons, uh, I've done these and participated in these. Are you planning in the early cases to put oil, not laser the retinotomy, laser the retinotomy, put gas or both? What are you thinking on those early cases? Gas, no oil, no laser. Um, I, the retinotomy, what I do is I press the edges together. Like for when I used to do submacular surgery for a, a, like a histo case where it's on top of the pigment, if it's on the pigment epithelium, you can't do submacular surgery. But if it's on top of the pigment epithelium, even now I've had some like a, a histo that, that was quieted down with Avastin from five months ago. It's now 2100. I just make this little retinotomy and take it out. But what I do, I take the tissue and use it like a smooth instrument, a soft instrument, and I literally massage the edges. So I bring the retinotomy edge to edge back together. And that expresses some of the viscoelastic as well. So it's together. Then we do fluid air exchange immediately and we aspirate at the back of it so that it sucks the implant up in there and gets rid of the viscoelastic we use to inject the scaffold. And that means it'll be implanted and the hole is slammed shut. Oil doesn't has a very low oxygen extraction ratio. I've done 60 macular patch grafts, Tamara Mahmoud's operation, and I've convinced him and many others that are now doing that to use medium-term PFO to leave PFO in for two weeks. Why? Because the, there's uh, PFO has three times the oxygen carrying capacity of hemoglobin, whereas uh, silicon oil has a very low oxygen extraction ratio. So you're causing ischemia when you use uh, silicon oil. That's why I hate it in diabetics. And mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm a huge fan of medium-term PFO. I use it for all my inferior detachments, inferior giant breaks as well. That's an area I'd love to get into at some point with you is, are we going to get a longer-term PFO at some point, you think? 
Well, I leave it in for two weeks, which is strong, long enough for coral retinal adhesions to form with laser. So uh, I've done over a thousand cases with medium term PFO. I've been doing it 22 years and published in the peer reviewed literature. But still, people beat me up in the podium. Oh my God, buckles, the standard of care. And, you know, <laughs> don't you know how to do a buckle anymore? I've said I've done 8,000, but you know, I got over it, just like I took the training wheels off my bike, you know? <laughs> you know, we're talking about so many cool operating techniques and, 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 and tools this is the interface that you live in engineering and surgery interfacing are you surprised or did, bothered uh, did historically that ophthalmologists on the whole not yourself obviously and there are others mark humayan has a great engineering background uh, that there's a a paucity of people that live at that interface with proper training in both uh, that it's two different camps trying to work together without the without the with the one guy or the 10 guys who do both? Well, we're, yes, I am concerned because where it goes wrong, uh, in fact, I just this afternoon recorded a lecture for the Harvard Fellows course because I'm doing an, or I've been working with Orbis for 30 years and there's a Orbis event at Oshkosh that is at the same time as the Harvard Fellows course. So I, just two hours ago, I recorded using Loom uh, the lecture and, and the lecture uh, was similar to one I gave to the Alcon Fellows meeting, which was a month ago. And, and the point I've made is when doctors use terms like flow efficiency, there is no physics or engineering term of flow efficiency. They're separate. Flow is cc's per minute. It's a volume construct over time. Efficiency is if you're drinking a milkshake and you hear, <laughs> that's because you're not in the milkshake. So if you're sucking out BSS, it's not efficient. So efficiency is 100% technique driven, not technology driven. Yet marketing people and doctors on the podium, oh, well, this probe is more flow efficient. What? They, they have no clue. And they, and they say, oh, this probe is fast cutting. No, high cutting rates are, don't, are not higher velocity. Fast is a velocity term. It's millimeters per second, you know, whereas cutting rates are cuts per minute. It's a frequency term. And just the people that don't even get that straight and don't understand things like duty cycle. But so if you're up there teaching others how to use this equipment or interfacing with industry to try to say what the parameters should be in the console and you don't understand basic, simple physics and simple math, that's a problem. For example, how do you peel ILM? Well, the microscope scales your position up, right? So what do you, how do you tell people to do it? Simple. Go really, really slow. They say, oh, are you, I wouldn't be efficient then. I'm telling you that this scales it up. The thing moves like that. So that you, I watch the fellows and I'm like, what's the, here's their approach to the island. Like that. They said, hey, slow down. Hey, slow down. Yeah. Precision takes, you got to slow. So the first velo uh, derivative of position is velocity, dbdt, and uh, dxdt. And so, and, and the first derivative of that's acceleration. So things like that, it, it helps me be a better surgeon and teach better and develop equipment better because I understand that stuff. But when I talk to the fellows, it's like, huh? You know, and it, sometimes it gets frustrating, you know? So they just tolerate me and they nod their head when I talk to them and they walk away. <laughs> they have no idea what I'm talking well. about. Why does the Heidelberg, and I don't consult for Heidelberg, why does it make great angiograms far better than any funnest camera ever did or ever will? Because it's confocal. So that means that 15 dB is better signal to noise ratio because the point source and the point detector are co aligned. That's what that, they're confocal. So all scattered light is rejected. That's a big deal. That, you can't fix that with more pixels on a fundus camera. It's possible. And uh, 15 dBs, that's a big deal. And But it's hard to get those point across to people that have no idea of simple physics and engineering. So we need more engineers going into clinical medicine. But you know what happens? They get that taste of dollars and, they, and the engineering stuff stops immediately. One way to, to make sure your engineering knowledge goes to hell in a handbasket, get an MBA. <laughs> You're in the chance when you see doctors that get an MBA, the amount that ever contribute on the design side, it's over. They can be engineering managers and it's yeah. good because they're literate, but, but their contribution on the technical side, as soon as they become a businessman, it's over. The whole technical contribution, it's over. That's great advice. I think my son, who's a young engineer, would agree with you. He's 25 and he has a master's degree in uh, mechanical engineering and, and an undergrad also. And I asked him, you know, do you want an MBA? Is that something? He's like, no, I, I don't. I want to I want to design and I want to create. And he, he saw the dichotomy that you just uh, described. 
And you know, biomedical engineers are not hired for design jobs either because it's too smorgasbord. It's too broad, and not deep enough. Uh, mechanicals and electricals and even in engineering and engineering physics people are the people that get the design jobs. And the people that know mechatronics, which mechanic, for example, if you if your son called me today and said, um, what, what should my next degree be? And I said electrical. Uh, because controls are what it's all about. I mean, whether it's a Tesla or an airplane or a, or a constellation, uh, the, the interaction between the mechanical world and all the transduction motors and sensors, uh, that's where the action is. And so you got to understand control theory. I'm glad we're on record. I'll take that as an invite for me to have Michael call you. So you, okay. might, you might get a call from young Michael sometime soon, Steve. Cool. <laughs> Speaking of the young guys, I wanted to ask you about this anyway. It's a good segue. We talked about stem cells, gene therapy peripherally, obviously surgical innovation, obviously surgery. Where should a young guy who's a vitreoretinal surgeon who feels he wants to be involved in innovation or wants to be entrepreneurial, where should they be looking in the next 10 or 20 years? What do you think are these frontiers that somebody uh, like what you've done wants to do again? Okay, well, uh, guys will come to me and they'll say, I'm going to start a company. I'll say, what's the product? And they'll say, huh? <laughs> I'm just going to explain to you, companies need a product. And they'll say, and I'll say, okay, well, let me start a different way. What technology are you literate in? What do you mean? I want to start a company. Well, in order to have a company, it has to have a product. And in, in this space, it has to be a technical product, whether it's biotech or it's engineering or laser physics or something, imaging. So, are you, well, I'm going to hire guys for that. And I said, why don't you study it? Why don't you hang with brilliant scientists in, in antigenesis or, or in complement, uh, alternative complement pathway or, or, or try to understand tumor biology because we've made no progress with melanomas in ever, forever. Why don't, why don't you study that? And, and, and they're like, oh, no, studying is something I did that was a pain in the ass in order to get a residency and a fellowship and a job. I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> well, 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 you know what? You're not going to win. Um, yeah. why, why am I doing reasonably well in, 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 in complicated things now? Because I study endlessly. I have a huge library in my, in my apartment. The room that was supposed to be a dining room is a library. And there's literally sections like a formal library, mechanical engineering, electronics, laser physics, photonics, optical system design, you know, neural networks, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I'm constantly reading and studying, but it's never reading for, quote unquote for pleasure. It's all about, I need to learn more about this. I buy a book every two weeks or so to teach me something. I read a book on fiber lasers over the weekend, really complex math, because I want to understand uh, how photonic crystal fibers and band gap fibers work and how CSAMs work and, and how chirp pulse amplification works. So I'm studying that stuff. But these, so many of these guys don't want to do that. They just want to be entrepreneurial. It's like a guy in a, people in a gym reading a book, 100 Ways to Satisfy Your Lover. If you're leading this, it's over. It ain't going to happen. You know? it's not gonna I call, happen. I call it aspirational innovation. You know, I want to I want to be famous. Well, OK, you know, jump up a building or something because you're not going to make it any other way. Um, it, it's it's it, there, there's not enough people willing to roll up their sleeves, do their homework and learn something. I don't know anything. I didn't know anything about stem bio, cell biology. I will not make a contribution there, but I don't want to be sticking implants underneath somebody's retina if I don't have a basic understanding of, of the biology behind it. I, I'll, I will never make a contribution there. I'm totally aware of that other than helping develop the technique and doing the cases, but I want to be able to talk to these guys and learn from them. And, and But if it's all about the business model and, and creating buzz and, and the website and fancy names for stuff and all that and the color and what, what the product looks like, but, but not understanding the functionality, that's the frustration to me. And, 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 uh, and I, but, you know, frankly, there are companies who are, you know, their core competency is buzz and they've made money. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, they're certainly, fam I mean, do you think uh, Floyd Mayweather has contributed to our culture? Well, he's the number one earning athlete in the world. And he's, uh, you know, multiple. I work, I, I uh, support some domestic violence victims personally, and I've been involved. I was on the board of the National Domestic Violence Hotline on the board of the Memphis Selby County Domestic, Sexual and Domestic Violence Council. And, and so here's a guy that's a, you know, a, a, a multiple times DV person, you know, perpetrator, 
it makes more money than anybody in the world. So it clearly buzz flies it works. And, yeah. and, and it does. And I hate it. Mm. You know, I mean, is Twitter really a value to our culture? I'm not sure. Um, is Facebook other than connecting with friends and family, a big contribution to our culture compared to their value. It's hard to say. Uh, so I'm not, that kind of stuff frustrates me. Uh, to see, but I, I'm with you. I think you're, you're absolutely spot on. And actually what you, uh, what you said about uh, to start, you know, I'm going to start a company and you're at, well, what, what's the company going to do? That is the epitome of what I termed earlier, you know, the tail wagging the dog. We have a lot of that, no question about it. And uh, it does work sometimes. And it is frustrating, I'm sure, to somebody like you who has rolled up his sleeves for so long. I, I consult for free for a guy that used to run both CT and then MR for uh, GE Medical Systems. And he's an he's a, a Orthodox Jew and he's in love with Israel. So he asked him, can I, hey, can I go run even for a dollar a year GE Israel? I want to live over there. I want to embed myself in the culture. He did. So now he has a venture firm and, and they, he shows me all this innovation coming out of Israel and has me review it. And I had a sort of a rude awakening where I said, Go back and look at my report card. When I said no, don't invest. How did I get it right? And or how often did I get it wrong? And or and and he said, well, uh, he went and they looked back over the data. And and there were a number of companies that I perceived of as buzz only that actually got second and third rounds of financing. And and and, and there's to me no real product that's going to help anybody. Uh, but but. I got it wrong in terms of the financial world. If I had to criticize myself, what I've done very poorly uh, is is raise capital. Um, it, it I have a startup right now that had the CEO of Blackstone was one of our investors, and he kind of pulled out, and the founder of AutoZone is a billionaire, kind of pulled out. I put 5.4 million, million in, and it's for neuro and spine. My dad died of a brain tumor, and I built a robotics company for that and sold it to Stryker, and now I'm doing a visualization company for neuro and spine, and it's extraordinarily cool. We've got 30 patents with Kenobi Martin, and we're out of money. And uh, so I'm not good at porting the financial world or understanding what makes it work. It's hard. It's about the buzz, no question, and, you know, you know Raising money is hard, and a lot of time it's uh, style over substance, unfortunately. There's no doubt yeah, about it. Well said. Well said. I want to get to the teaching part. You you know, God knows how many fellows you've trained. You, I'm sure, know the number. But before we get into the training of the docs, how much lecturing are you doing these days? How much of the international surgery are you still doing? Are you still writing a lot? Well, I rewrote my entire book, uh, uh, 330 pages, all in 30 chapters, many new, six new chapters. So a complete rewrite of the book. Um, I uh, put seven uh, lectures, not surgery, but lectures on iTube. Uh, and I've got 20 uh, lectures, so many lectures on Alcon's Experience Academy. But last year, because of COVID, I didn't travel internationally, but it, I gave more lectures than I've ever done before. I, because of Zoom and another software. For example, I had, I did, I think seven or eight lectures to India, typically 3,000 surgeons. A couple of them had 7,000 people online. So I've done it for Orbis. I've done it for, for example, I spoke at the New Orleans Academy and I gave six talks or five talks. While I was there, six talks that I pre recorded in two live. Uh, panel discussions were for the Philippines Academy of Ophthalmology and the Philippine Vitriol Society. So Zoom has, now that it's being adopted so worldwide and, and other, you know, WebEx and, and uh, Microsoft Teams and other software I've used, it's allowed me to, to teach all the time. I mean, it's incredible. Uh, so I love it. Uh, I love the lecture. I never give the same lecture twice. I'm constantly revising. I spent three hours working on lectures today because they're rebuilding parts of stuff at our surgery center. So I lost an operating day, only did three cases today instead of eight or nine. So lots of teaching. Vitreous microsurgery, you, you made me think of an anecdote that I want to share with you that in the years we've known each other, I've never shared with you. So this will be the first time you've heard it. And I might get in trouble here in a minute. When I moved to California, I guess it's well, it's over 20 years ago now. I packed up my books and stuff, and I came and I discovered, and I probably recently met you around that time. I was probably five, seven years in practice, and uh, I discovered that I had your original vitreous microsurgery textbook, pretty small. I think it's issue one, uh, 1970 something, I'm guessing. I don't know. And um, sadly, uh, 
I realized then, and I still have it, and I'm going to ask you to sign it for me sometime in the near future. Uh, I never returned it to the Yukon Medical School Library. I probably owe about $400,000 in late fees that I checked it out as a med student in 1987, and I still have it. And if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you to sign it one point. I will, and I'll pay the fees. Okay. okay. Very, very good. It shows. I sold the, the David Payton and, and Daisy Stillwell's book, Atlas of Eye Surgery, out of the VA library when I lived at the VA as a freshman medical student. And the, and the, I read, the residents at Baskin Palmer give me broken instruments, and I take them to the machine shop to fix them, and then practice all these procedures on greyhound dogs that they were using for kidney transplants. So I did trabeculectomies and, and filtering other peripheralectomies and planned extra caps and even lid procedures on these greyhound dogs while I was helping them do kidney transplants. But I stole that book and I still have it. That's amazing. I, I'm going to definitely bring it to a meeting. I want you to see it because it does have the Yukon Med Library imprint inside with the checkout date. And I, I'd love you to sign it. We'll have a laugh over it next time we're together. That's great. Let me ask you about vitreo retinal fellowship training. And I, I, we don't have that much time left, but I'm, I know you've trained a zillion and I know many of your former trainees, of course, around the country. Um, what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? What could we do better? And ultimately, I want you to weigh in on, do we, do we need, this was talked about some years ago, uh, the late great Paul Ternambi uh, took some issues and with this, do we need a vitreo retinal board? Is this something that we need? And I'd love to hear your thoughts. Do we need a vitro retinal what? I missed that A board. board, like we'd have our oh, own board. board certification as okay, a ophthalmologist. Uh, uh, so let, let, me, let me first comment on, uh, if you look at the, the business trend, the practices are huge. There's lots of private equity play out there, as you know. And uh, and one of the reasons they're huge is to, for, for geographic spread because of this absolute explosion of the need for intravitreal injections and OCT interpretation. So. The average fellow probably goes into practice where they go four or five places uh, every week, spend time in their car, driving to satellite offices, looking at OCTs and injecting, uh, and, 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 and then that's fine. They're helping patients. It's an incredible miracle drug, the, the whole array of anti-VHF compounds we have. It's extraordinary, safe, extraordinary safety profile. So it's wonderful, and I'm not putting it down. When I, people say burnout, burnout, helping patients and getting paid, paid to inject, really? you're burning out doctor then you, you should have been a golf pro or something and uh, i don't i don't get that and i don't get the burnout thing when i hear it it, it irritates me because they're helping patients the a and d patients had crap revision until anti-vegf compounds dme is much better treated this way than it is with laser it's a big deal but here's the problem now you've got this huge uh, injection you know of, of volume to be done and so people will join a practice with 8 10 12 15 partners and and the average guy's doing three cases a week in the operating room and until people are willing to say i'm not capable of doing a diabetic traction attachment or a pbr or a macter patch gap those are hard here's our designated tough surgery guy and then and then if you look at the economics, we may, I make more, I mean, I do a lot of surgery and I make more money in the office than I do in the OR. I make more money uh, doing OCTs and injecting. So in, if you look at, there's roughly 125 fellowships and about 25 are medical, I might be a little off, but it's roughly it. You wonder, should that balance shift to be more medical? Um, and you wonder if, if having a surgeon that's the tough case surgeon can evolve. Nobody can mandate that. But, but, you know, egos and, and greed and all that are, are not easily managed, as, as we all know. So that's a problem. Now, with respect to the board, you know, the vast majority of, of vitriol surgeons that are uh, probably the majority, I don't know if the word vast is right, that are academic players are actually in private practice. And, and so the fellow funding comes from the, the revenue they generate as a second year. But if you had an ACA GME approved fellowship, then you can't charge for their services. According to Medicare, fellows and residents are identical, and you don't get paid for supervision, period. And, and you can't. That's against the rules. So you've got to participate in the patient's care and be in the room and provide care yourself or you don't get paid. And so, so th there's this thing where it sounds nice to have an ACMG approved fellowship, but where's the money going to come from? Um, to, to pay their salaries and their expectations are much higher than when I trained. Uh, I mean, I mean, you know, 
$19,000 a year at the NIH or something like that. And the fellows are making 80 or something and have plenty of vacation time and, you know, great health insurance and maternity insurance and all that stuff. And uh, which is fine. I mean, I'm glad to have them rewarded, but, but uh, it's a bit upside down. Uh, and the private equity thing is tossed another hope of, of you know, a level of complexity on these practices. And when I look at the private equity thing, um, I'm not sophisticated enough to judge is there going to be a play on their stock or it's only the front end money. But but um, uh, if MBAs are going to decide for us how the practice is modeled and, and address some of these decisions we're talking about, uh, that's a, a paradigm I'm not comfortable with. And uh, so, uh, for example, could I get a check from a private equity firm right now? Yeah. Do I want one? No. I want it, and, and I don't have, I'm not sitting on a lot of money because I put 5.4 in this startup that, that might fail. And uh, so it's not that I don't need money. Uh, it'd be nice for my kids and all that. Um, although two of my daughters are physicians and do quite well. And, uh, but what I, but I, you know, our, our business is very complex right now. For example, what will happen to clinical trials revenue, what will happen to rebates and, and variable pricing on pharmaceuticals, what will happen with biosimilars. It's a very complex marketplace, more than ever before. It is, uh, and I, I like the point you were making and we're starting to elaborate on with the, that's the guy who does the complex surgery. I, I still teach our fellows and we teach fellows here and we're in a very academic private practice, just sure. as you described, we do tons of trials and we train fellows. Um, I tell them, look, in real life, it, when we retina surgeons evaluate each other and talk to each other and consider who's really great, often it comes down to, you know, can the guy fix a retinal detachment? What kind of successes is he getting? And I find that that's sort of gone because of the economics of it. It's kind of been pushed to the side, even though we in the business respect that aspect of it, maybe at the highest level. And there's so much money in the injections and the OCT and the industry drug side. I think it's taken away from some of the even admiration of the skill of what we do in the OR for the harder stuff. I think we should focus on that. The problem is the economics of it. And we have to find a way or maybe convince Medicare or the others that there's real value in that because it's diminishing. There's no question about it. It, it, it. The Medicare consciously to save facility fees, not just surgeons fees, uh, constant changed the reward to the office. And, and, and they made a bad call in terms of overall cost because now we get paid to, to inject and to read OCTs, you know. And, mm -hmm. uh, but but uh, I mean, look at one other aspect real quick. Like I know we have probably only have another minute or two, but what's, what's really interesting and, and almost terrifying is how hard biologics are. Example, neurodrugs, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS, average trial, 8.5 years, average cost, 2.3 billion, average failure rate, 90%. Jeez. Well, the retina, the retina is brain tissue. It's it, neurologic, for yeah, sure. Yeah, it's retina, it's brain. And, and if you look at, for example, ad barum, a patient, pandiviitis hypotony, one of David Brown's patients, he's an investor and he said, it's the first drug that actually blinded a patient, okay? And, and bright people trying to do the right thing, lots of money spent, it's going to go down the drain, most likely. Um, we, you know, Jatria was a 1-800 bad drug. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah. you know and, and, and so there are um, the DARPAN's you know, inflammation withdrawn study. Um, the, some other clinical trials, of course, Bayoview has had this post-market uh, analysis shown. And now the, many of the clinical trials for Bayoview are being are, are on hold. Um, and so, in short, it's hard, and and yet there's biosimilars, and biosimilars are not the same molecule. Uh, they're similar, <laughs> and therefore the there's the likelihood we're going to see inflammation and serious side effects in biosimilars. Great, and 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 yet they're out there trying to you know be bottom feeders in terms of the cost side of the equation. It's um, I'm concerned about biosimilars, and and I'm and I'm concerned that, that dollars may escape if you have continue to have a high failure rate when things like DARPA and Jutri and all these are turns out being failures. It's, it's a tough it's a tough game. Thank you, Steve. You're right. We're up on, against it on time. Thank you for the insights. Thank you for coming. I, the, your level of busyness, I, I I know what it is. We've heard about it, and and we know what it is. 
uh, for the audience, Steve Charles, uh, literally a living legend in the specialty, my friend, a, a great guy I've, I've enjoyed over the years talking, joking around with you. You're always pleasant at the meetings. Really a joy to have you. And, and by the way, a, a plug for us and, and an invite to you. We're going to have the OIS retina meeting uh, just prior to ASRS in San Antonio. That'll be October 7th. It's always the Thursday before. Uh, we're going to have it. We hope people will come and want to be in person. OIS is a fabulous meeting. Steve, you'll get my invitation and maybe Wonderful. you'll be able to join us as a panelist. I look forward to it. I've attended many meetings in the past. But it's a extraordinary operation. I'm delighted to be involved. Thank you. Thanks for coming on, Steve. Really an Thank honor. You, my friend. My pleasure. Be well. We hope you enjoyed this episode and took some notes in the process. As Dr. Ray Hall mentioned, we hope you will join them and other innovators, investors, and industry leaders at what promises to be the standout meeting of the year. Sign up at OIS.net today.